uh, training block. Uh, so we, we discussed, uh, I, I, I introduced the package and I introduced some theoretical concepts and I was uh, doing a few examples, but now we can go more in, uh, more in depth and uh, we can uh, look at uh, different things. Um, so typically what I do in the second block, I, I run a, what, what is called a plot camel tutorial. And this tutorial is also available. Uh, let me see. So it's available um, on the YouTube. So if you look at the plot camel video tutorial, so this should bring you to a YouTube video. So what I did, I I just went on and uh, recorded without any music. I mean, usually they put Mozart music or something. Uh, so I just I just recorded, uh, um, you know, I'm me sending lines and getting visualizations. And so uh, the, the official tutorial is uh, under a, a special page. And there's also also all these things on the special page. They're also available in the, the plot KML method. So if you just do a question mark plot KML, then you get the whole tutorial. So this has uh, more or less everything that you see in the uh, everything that you see in the gallery. So all the things you see in the gallery they are uh, available in tutorial. So then you can see how I, I start I initiate the the package and then I set a working directory and. I can set up the environment, so there's some default settings. Uh, there are some there are some uh, packages which are needed also uh, that I'm, I've been using. I'm using them now less and less. I don't like these dependencies to external packages. So I try to use them less and less, but nevertheless I like to use, um, for example, FW tools. I like to use them for uh, resampling uh, rasters and for converting. Um, I don't know if you played with YouTube, but in YouTube you can record your screen and then once you upload it, then you can you can do all this direction. You can put the text and you can put subtitles and everything. So you can do really nice uh, video tutorials. Um, so in the plot camel tutorial, of course, we go from something simple to something really complicated. So it, it's like story develops. So we start with points, lines. Uh, plotting vector layers is easier, of course. Uh, you see that the, the the general scheme is always the same. You go, you load some object, uh, some data, then you you have to maybe reorganize it a bit, and then you do a plot KML. So basically, that's what it boils down to. So uh, and then you you go from R to Google Earth constantly. Uh, so this is uh, polygons. Uh, in polygons, you can also you can put this elevation, so it's kind of uh, creates like these blocks. Uh, so if you if you attach some attribute attribute to a polygon, then you can see okay that's a high or low, and that's that's very commonly used in in uh, with the KML. So many people use it to emphasize, for example, country income or uh, differences between areas. Uh, then what we also spend a lot of time doing is. Uh, getting the raster data to uh, Google Earth, so that's an example with uh, going directly from uh, from a raster layer to Google Earth. So that was a bit more complicated, and uh, and for this reason we had to figure it also because you have rasters can be different projection systems, but when you do a plot KML, then we do a reprojection for you. So we had to program this generic uh, reproject method. And so that's a, a reprojection to the geographical coordinates, to the official uh, Google Earth coordinate system. So that's supposed to work automatically. And then you can play also with legends, uh, with the legends, so setting up the uh, plotting limits, lower and uh, upper. Um, and then you can do this transparency. So, so this is a topographic wetness index derived in a Saga GIS. And we actually use the same uh, color palette used in Saga GS, so you, you get kind of a very similar visualization, so you can quickly go, 
you know, you look in Saga.js, you look in Google Earth, you get about the same thing, except in Google Earth, you get all this background imagery and everything. Um, this was a, a visualization of um, uh, field photographs. And this one, actually, I, I uploaded a field photograph in uh, Wikimedia Commons. And so once I upload it, I just need to know the name on Wikimedia Commons, and then the Wikimedia Commons has a API. API, it means it will serve you uh, different processes and it allow you to program on top of it. And then you can, you can uh, get all this metadata for that photograph. And you can put like a photograph, it's uh, in 3D space and you can move around it. So that's, that's what I already showed you, I think. So that's a soul profile, uh, photograph of a soul profile. So, you know, this, what I made this uh, uh, video tutorial is that, you know, when you start running it and you get, you, you get an error message or you're not sure if it's an error message, if it's going, if, if the code is okay, then you can always use this as a reference. So when you run an analysis for the type of data that you look at, you can always use it as a, as a reference. So you say, okay, that's what he gets and I get like this and so, okay, there's some difference. This is this uh, 3D objects. Um, which they, they said, why are you making these skyscrapers? Um, and so what I use, I, I, crea I create my 3D objects to visualize uh, uh, soil uh, stratigraphy. So uh, I trick a bit uh, Google Earth. So, and, and I do create like a huge object. They don't, they're not, I mean, if it's, a, if it's a two meter profile, I plot it like uh, 150 meter wide or something because I want to look at the profile from a distance and I want to see it in, in, the, in the natural landscape. This was uh, space-time data, uh, so data from meteorological stations, so you can also visualize space-time objects, and then when you slide with a, a time slider, you can uh, see how the things change. Uh, then also you can have a space-time uh, rasters. Uh, so when you get the space-time rasters, then uh, you can kind of animate. You can see how something, like if you do some analysis, which is space-time, and you simulate some process, then you, if you share this space-time stack, then people can like slide and, you know, play with it and see and say, okay, that's what's going on. There's also, I have uh, lots of uh, embedded data sets and I have some really funny data sets. I have, for example, the observations of the Yeti. So there's these people that voluntarily see Yeti and they enter where they saw it. So I took this uh, Yeti data and I did some species distribution modeling with it. Um, <laughs> this is also me cycling to Ezer. So I cycled from the Netherlands to Ezer and I had on my bicycle GPS and you can see my driving speed. So this is uh, color is used for the speed. And you can see also when I stopped on a crossing or when I have to climb some hill, then I slow down a bit or... Um, then I also, I lost my way a few times, so then I had to go back, but... Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a, a data set that has a story. Uh, color is the, so red is uh, faster and blue is slower, I think. That's the geostatistical mapping. I think the uh, last one is, uh, this is one uh, sampling. So this is to do equal area sampling. And again, you can play with transparency. So you see where the points are going to fall and if there's some problems. So, you, you know, you create a sampling plan, but you can validate it quickly. You know, if the sampling, if the points fall on the street or... Um, if they fall in the water, you say, okay, now I have to, have to go back and fix that. So, uh, so that, that was the, the plot KML. <coughs> yep. To define your project, how do you print it out? Because you are out of the iron now, like, you know. So you have to read the Google Geo guidelines, and then you go, I think it's a, um, you know, you start reading general information and then you say, okay, I would like to print a poster. Okay, so I want to print a poster 
which has a, a screenshot like this. You see, like this screenshot. They say, I want to make print a poster. And then you have to go and then they ask you, okay, is it for, a, I don't know, commercial purposes? How many copies you're going to print? Da, da, da. Then if it's for commercial purposes, most probably you're in a, you will be in a situation where they will send you a bill. Okay? Uh, if you say, well, I'm, I'm doing a research and I'm a scientist and um, I want to show it on a conference, then I, I'm, I'm not like 100% sure, but 99% that it's no problem. As long as you do it, as long as you save the screenshot from here. So if you say save, save image, if you do it from here, that's what they recommend because then it will have all the copyright signs. So if the copyright signs are there, then I don't think they will make a problem. That's, that's what I remember when I read the, uh, the GEO guidelines maybe two years ago or one year ago. But you know, these things also change, you have to check. I, I saw lots of posters with uh, Google Earth and then there's also on TV, they will show Google Earth, but could be that the commercial TV stations, they do have a, a contract with Google. So let me see if this still this thing is still on. Uh, geo guidelines. Google. Geo permissions, yeah. And so 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 here is uh, use maps in print on the web in the applications. So Using maps on the web, I'd like to use your maps on my web, but what do I need to know? And now you have to read. Yep. Okay, normally, as far as I remember, the, you know, of course, also these companies, if they don't make it very clear, they have to have us like a summary. We're not lawyers, we cannot read like 30 pages every time we need something. So I'm pretty sure they also have some um, some summary that explains the basics. Let me see this one. Yeah, you have to you have to read the basics and then they have it in a bit more plain language. Uh, what I remember was like if you save it, if you save an image from Google Earth. And if you uh, use it like for a conference, for a poster or something which is not commercial, not a commercial application, it shouldn't be a problem, okay? But if you have a company and you want to, uh, let's say you make a, a book that you're selling and you want to sell that book, then uh, I guess there is a copyright issue. This one is a uh, KML uh, handbook, and that's also, um, it's a really good uh, resource. So that's not the plot KML handbook, that's a KML handbook, okay? So don't get confused there. And it, it shows you every, like, it gives you, let's say, 60, 70% of the main things that are available with KML with people, like, you know, companies and people use. So what I usually, I look at the, the it's like in the plot KML, there's the gallery. You can see example, and you can see the code that goes with that gallery. And then you get surprised. We say, wow, you can do so many things. You can do uh, connections to MySQL. You can use web mapping services. And that's why they actually call it geographical visualization for the web. Beca because actually the good practice is to not to have the data like we do it locally. The, practice is, the good practice is to have the, the data on a server, on a web. Okay, so then you get just get chunks, you know, the, like if I zoom somewhere else, then I get new, new pixels or new polygons and stuff. I'll send this bit around so you can send this, you can take a look at it. So I like to use it because I, I can see the, it's like, like with the plot KML, I can see the visualization and I can see the code. And then I can do, I can say in, in plot KML, I can say, well, I want this type of display. Now, how do I program it? And then I make a, our functions to do uh, uh, KML. Okay. 
Okay, so what I want to run now uh, with you, and I'll open the R Studio because I think that's what most of you are using. I want to run some examples and then uh, we can then maybe focus on some things which you, where you're not sure or uh, you can also ask me if you would like to try to do something with your data so then we can maybe help you. Let's say I don't need this thing. So I'll open, a, I'll start with an empty script and I will start by loading the package. So here I load the package. And then I can look at the plot KML. And there's all this code, all this code here. So that's all the things we can run. There's lots of examples, so we, we don't have time to go through everything. So I will start really gently, and so you can follow that. And then you can go and um, you can go and look at the uh, more detailed examples. The, the complete, really complete R script with all the demo, it's available in the installation of of plotkml, so I have to go to my R installation and then in library plotkml there is a demo and you see it's called also plotkml.r so that's the complete uh, complete R script. So these are the these are the things you find in the gallery and um, and, the, and then there's also explanation. So you can follow just the code, but you can also read the text that explains different things. So here's the uh, no, Doku Wiki. I like using this Doku Wiki because it shows you not only the code, it shows you the output, it shows you the plots, and also it will automatically embed all the help documentation, it will embed links. So if I, if I go say, oh, what is library? And then it will point me to the documentation for functions. So that's why I like to use this docu wiki. And so, sorry? No, no, we made one generic function which is called reproject. So take from any coordinate system to the uh, uh, geographical coordinate. So, so if I do, let's, so let's do that. We can start doing that. Um, uh, oh yeah, the, it, if the coordinate system is not correct, then it, there will be problems, yes. So here's this uh, German uh, data set and, and this data set has, if I look at the structure, it has some American, uh, uh, German uh, coordinate system. Yeah, it's a, so we have a spatial points data frame. And you can see that the coordinates are some transverse mercato. This is the, uh, it's called Gauss Krieger. I'm not sure which zone, but that's, that's, uh, that's the system used for that part of Germany. Okay. And now we made this uh, function, which is, I can also just run it like this. So that's a function from uh, plot KML package because we discovered on the end it's the easiest thing is just to make our own functions um, and I just say reproject that's it okay and then when I do that I just get it to VGS and this function will also work if you have grids it will also reproject a grid so when you use a raster package the SP package you have to make a code for us, it wasn't, that wasn't convenient. So we wanted to have just a, like very uh, straightforward. You just say reproject. And so we have it uh, reproject now working both with point, raster data, whatever. 
Okay, so uh, then I have to I, ha I have to subset because otherwise the the data is just too big. And now look at the the difference. If I do in SP package, there's a bubble method. So then you will do something like this, uh, except it doesn't work with the uh, missing values. So let's see. So I have to get the missing values out. Um, is, it, is that this here? It should work. Yeah, so if you do, if you want to visualize this uh, clay content in R, you get something like this, okay? So that's fine. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a correct plot. Maybe I will turn the legend upside down, flip it. Oh, yeah, sorry. There are some missing values, so you have to do a bubble, Eberg, and then select only the complete values and plot only this layer. So that's a bubble plot. It also well, because you see I here randomly subset and I randomly subset, you randomly subset, we get the different subsets. So your subset might work, my won't. If you don't subset that, it's for sure it's not going to work. You'll have to do like me. And so, uh, what I you, you can see that I basically mimic now with the plot KML. If I do plot KML, I basically mimic this uh, bubble uh, bubble plot command. That's kind of the where I, st I start from. Uh, Okay, now I get my first error message and it says I, I'm waiting for Google Alert. It's not coming because uh, what happened here is that I'm in a directory where I don't have a write. You see, plot KML is a, it, 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 it wants to write a KML file. And I was in some default directory that I get for my Windows and my document something. And, and then I don't have a write permission there, so I couldn't write. So I have to rerun this and now I get it in Google Alert. So, so that's the difference between, you see, that's the difference between R and uh, Google Earth, of course. Now I can also zoom in into points and I can see where the actual points are. And I can say, okay, this point is somewhere in the forest, it's in the bottom of the hill. And uh, somehow here is the clay content is a bit higher and then it drops here. And, and then on here it's even lower. So somehow the, is it, yeah, it's a clay content, it's, it's lowest here at the, the bottom of the hill, so it's interesting. But this is the clay content of the first horizon. I can also now say, okay, give me the clay content for the fourth horizon. And now we'll have to turn on and off. So I turn this one. So let's take a look again somewhere here. So now I have, here is the first horizon. Uh, sorry, here is the fourth horizon. And then I turn on the first horizon. So things quite, they change a lot going from the top horizon to like the fourth horizon. Somewhere the things change, somewhere they don't change so much. Okay, if I want to really get a very similar plot to the one that I have seen uh, in R, then I have to play with this color, color scale. So I said the color scale now this is a bit silly here. I do a, I have to put two colors and I put two, uh, so a copy of the color. So it will fill it in with a single color. It's a bit silly, but it works. So you get, you get this thing. So you can see everything in a single. So now I limited uh, the changes of values. I limited only to one, 
uh, static parameter and that's the the size of the bubble. So I turn kind of a color off. This thing allows you, I mean, you can quickly see that there's a spatial autocorrelation, right? I mean, if you look at it. And there's also correlation with the landscape. So this allows us to kind of try to understand that there are some correlations. If I look, for example, at... So I'm skipping a bit now uh, here. So here's my topographic wetness index. And now I want to know, hey, is, is clay content correlated with topographic wetness index? So I'm looking, I'm looking if the small values, so the small bubbles, only happen where I have a, a red or if I have blue. So what do you think? Is it correlated? What do you think? Well, I also look what I discovered. When I just look at the, the map, I don't see many, like the points are kind of spread all around. But now when I derive like a topographic wetness index, I see this blue color. It's been systematically undersampled. That's something we're going to talk about tomorrow. So I can see that this blue color is a, it's a, was a bit ignored in the sampling. So uh, to be honest with you, I don't see really correlation between background raster and the uh, values of the clay content. I don't, it's not clear to me. I don't see a clear correlation. So we have to put some other layer. Let's try the, the, the polygons. So here's a, a polygon map. Aha, uh -huh. polygon looks like, looks like in this polygon we always get, we always get lower values. Can you see this? This polygon, kind of, in red polygon we always have high values. And in this polygon we always have lower values, except a few points here and here. Can you see this? And this thing is somewhere in between. So if you know soil science, then you know that uh, geology, it's uh, very important for explaining texture. And so for this geology, they also said, okay, here's more sandy material. And that's why the clay content here, it's lower. And here it says clay uh, derivatives, clay and less. So here we have a clay and less it's not too difficult to predict higher clay content. So probably the best predictor here for clay will be this mapping unit, this red mapping unit. So far, it's so good. Any problems with plotting things? Anybody has problems? No? Are you all just uh, looking at emails anyway? No? <laughs> I have different colors. Uh, slightly different or completely different? If you're running the same code, you should have just slightly different colors. The polygons? Uh, yeah, these are... Um, it's the same. This is, this is the default colors I use for factor type of data. And you see for polygons, I also plot the uh, centroids. I plot them by default, but these are all my choices. I mean, I, I made those choices and you can go around them. I mean, it's not a issue, but if you just use plot KML on any polygon, you will get also centroids. Because what I put on centroids, I put a label. Because I discovered that if you want to see a polygon in a Google Earth, you want to see a label. I mean, otherwise you don't know what you're dealing with. Yes? Is it possible to create this list to see all the labels? 
Yes, you can make animations and you can open animations in Google Earth. Yeah, it's possible. There were some glitches before, but I think they solved it. So, so kind of yes, but it's much nicer like, oh yeah, by the way, this is a KML also in OpenStreetMap. You can, if you put it somewhere, you can also uh, open it in, uh, or you can make like a, uh, in a website embedded code. So you put the KML and, uh, but, but it lost the colors. So that's the KML I produce in plot KML. And then I open it in OpenStreetMap, but I lose the colors. I do get the labels, but I lost the colors. So things that like this will happen. So be ready for that. Now for the animations, what I prefer to do for animation is uh, something like this. Let me see where was it. That's what we did in the Saga GS uh, day. So, you know, you just have this, you have PNGs and then you have a slider. This is a elevation model produced geostatistical simulations. And you can even put a plot, you can put a plot over Google Earth that shows how the values, values change locally so for this cross section this white line you see here see this white line that's a cross section and for this cross section you can see how the values change for 10 simulations so you can animate nicely with google earth of course and you just have to you have to create a stack of uh, pngs so these are different simulations see here and then i do a, I, I do a trick okay i mean it's a uh, I don't think when they made this uh, time slider and people that develop Google, they never thought, okay, this will be something where people will use it for visual and statistical uncertainty. But why not? I mean, I attached some silly dates. So the only thing I, I, I have to say, okay, this is year one, two, three, whatever. So I attached some silly dates. And you can see that, uh, or, or I use the default date when I release the software first time, and then I just put day plus one day, second day, and so on. So there are some um, dummy dates. And because I don't use this to share a space-time data, I just use it to visualize the uncertainty in digital elevation model. Because all the displays there, the legend is fixed, so the only thing which changes is the uncertainty of the values. And you see how the pixels, they dance a bit, right? Yeah, uh, there's this example also with, uh, I want to show you this thing with the point pattern. Uh, there's the space-time krieging, so that's the stuff you've been doing uh, with the, for those of you that were with Ben. So it's the same, same example that he uses in that block. There's also blo uh, this example how it works with the uh, plot KML, so we can run that one. And this one is also space-time example with the foot, foot and mouth disease data. So that's for my line 100, 102. So that's this foot and mouth disease data from the STPP, so space-time point patterns package. And uh, th this is somewhere in the uh, UK, and you have to attach the coordinates and then you can uh, extract the dates. And now we can create a special temporal irregular data frame. So that's all easy. And, and now I just go and plot it. That's it. I just do plot KML on a special temporal irregular data frame. And so what we get is uh, we get a, a space-time point pattern. And now first, okay, we see, okay, this is the foot and mouth. These are the actual dates now. So now I'm not using dummy dates. These are real uh, actual dates. Question? Uh, it's about the dates. What if uh, only have my data set and I only have the year? Uh, that's no problem. Uh, it's, no, it's no problem when you, when you have a, it, no, if you use plot KML or even I think if you use space time, it will force it to a POSIX, POSIX uh, CT class. Yes, 
and so it will force it. So it will, if you have only year that it will put, probably it will put 1st of January. 1st of January, yeah. That's, that's my guess. Um, so here you have this foot and mouth disease data. And uh, when you just, when I do a plot KML on it, then I get all the points. But when I scroll uh, the cursor left and I change the temporal support, I can now inspect what happens with that data set. How did this, how did the foot and mouth disease spread? And you see, I also use the, the, the blue color is for the uh, date, I think. So the red ones happened later and the blue ones happened earlier. You see, so you can, you can animate how this disease sp spread around. So actually it went quite quickly in the beginning. You see, that's the beginning and then it went around quickly, and then it probably spread to some more distant farms, and then, and then they dealt with it probably, and then, okay? So, no, I mean, th this will be very difficult to plot this in R and to like get really knowledge about it, and here you can really play, and you can play with this temporal support very quickly. So you can say, okay, there are two phases. There's this phase, there's this phase. Huh? When you play with that uh, temporal support. So it gives you, gives you really this, uh, you can see the space-time patterns, the way you wouldn't be able to see it. Well, you will have to imagine it a bit, maybe if you just look at the table data so you can imagine it. But here you just play and suddenly, wow, okay, I, I see some pattern here. Yes, you need to install it. So install packages, HTTP, P. Yes, it comes. All the plot KML examples are the data sets in the packages. And there's maybe 20 data sets here, but they're all in the packages, yeah. Makes, very, it makes this tutorial very portable. I just send you the code and, and then you get, you get the packages. Let me, th let me see this Krieging. I don't know if it's working because actually Ben, ben made this code. Ben also started, contributed to PlotKML. <coughs> now, this is the uh, space-time Krieging, but I didn't check it for some time. Let me see if it's going to work. Yeah, it works. So, and this is just uh, uh, space-time Krieging for uh, three dates. And so you can visualize them in, in R like this. So when I do just ST, ST plot, so you have a SP plot, ST plot. And then if I come to uh, Google Earth, then I just do the same thing, just a, a plot KML. And we get the, we get the uh, predictions. I do have to turn off this Ebergotzen because it's somewhere in the back here. And, and and then you can see, okay, we really took, we just took uh, three predictions and the pixel size is huge. Pixel size is huge. I mean, the whole, whole German is like 30 pixels. <coughs> if I want to put the points on the top, this should be possible also. Yeah, here below. Then I just say, yeah, add the points. And now we see both the points. And now if I scroll in space and time, I can, I can see how the predictions change and how the observed values change. <coughs> That's quite powerful now, right? You can do, you can do validation in space time. Looks okay. I mean, uh, the color the colors on the same scale, of course. So, what is sample? What is interpolated? You can see there's there's some local differences. And uh, missing values are usually just white. Did you manage to run this? The space time creating. 
So if you manage to run this one, you just adapt that code and you apply it to the, the spatial prediction competition game, it should be easy. There's only one small problem in spatial prediction competition. There are covariates and it's 3D plus time. It's a slightly bit more complicated. Uh, yeah. No, you'll make fun of yourself tomorrow when you submit the predictions. Some people really offshoot, like, paf. Who is planning to submit, by the way? <laughs> One? Yes? Try, good. Huh? You never know. You j just do something, you know, uh, calculate how much time you have left and just go for something simple and, you know, so that's the best, the best I, I managed to make. Yes, you are going to apply also? No? You're having a problem installing which one? Um, the block CML, uh, it says packages available in the source package, but not in the binary. It says it's not available for R version 3.1.2. Point point Anybody else had a problem with the R.3.1.0? Point 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 What's my version of R? I don't know it. So I have 3.0.2. Uh, let me check on the website. So it says here, says here, no problem. You know what you can do? You can download, are you Windows or no, you Mac? Ah. Um. Ah, it says here, uh, binaries are at least not available, but there's this one, TGZ. Did you see, have you, can you see this one? Oh, yeah. So you can just download it, right click download it, and then you say install packages from zip file or something, and then try that. Sometimes it happens, yeah, there's a, usually with the R and, and Mac there, there will be problems, yeah. I don't want to say anything against Mac people, but uh, you, you have to be prepared that it might get more difficult. Yeah, so what, what you have to do, which, which uh, OS, uh, Mac OS you have? The Leopard or Mavericks? Because Maverick says there's no, not available. So you, I will just try like this, just right click this, save it, and then try to install from the TGZ file. Okay, so that was the space-time krieging. Um, I'm looking mainly. I'm looking for things that is interesting for you. Uh, so this one we did also. Oh yeah, this was this was with the spatial sampling. So there's this Spicosa. So that's a package made by a colleague from Wageningen University. And it allows you to do um, equal area sampling. So, so if you have some, let's say this is a, you have some farms. Let's plot this. So here's a farm, nothing special, just polygons. And now we want to say, well, we want to sample for this farm and we want to sample using uh, optimized equal area sampling. So then we go, we create the stratification. This is equal area stratification. And then we can say, well, we want to sample two points per each strata. Uh, 
and then I need to get this object and I can do then plot KML. So this looks nice. I mean, I can uh, I can now see directly the output. So you see, there's this uh, optimized uh, location of the strata, and then it's randomized with, within strata. But I could also say I'd only want. Let's say now, let's recompute it. I said I only want a one point per strata. So I change this thing here, and the rest I just rerun. And now I'm only with the one point per strata. So I can I can play with these things. And as I said, you can then set up transparency and say, okay, this, this makes sense. And I can see that actually this polygon, hmm, now things have really changed. So there's some pixels going over the street. I don't think that belongs to that farm. Right, you see this? So maybe that shape file that they prepared for this data is, is a bit outdated. This is a randomized sampling, so, and you, ca you I can validate now if each polygon gets one point, so that's more or less true. So that's kind of it's a it's a um, randomized sampling, but I get a, a maximum geographical coverage. Well, not maximum, but I get um, I, I make sure that all the points then don't get any spatial clustering. So it's called equal area stratification. <coughs> and actually also the size of these polygons is created based on the sh of the, um, this shape outside. So the polygons which are in the center, they will be a bit round, but the polygons which are on the edges, they get a bit different shapes. This is this raster brick simulations. Oh yeah, this is this funny data set, the Bigfoot data set. You can read about this data set. It's, it's quite, um, I think it's quite educational to use um, not so serious data sets. And so this explains all this data set. So what I did, I went to their website there's a Bigfoot research organization, B B F R O. Ever heard of it? And so they really put an effort to record all the places where the Bigfoot was seen. And of course, it's most of the points in U.S. Uh, open link. Where did it go? Copy link. <laughs> So here's the website, and what I did, I went, and so here this all this occurs. So what I did, I went there and I downloaded. This we actually it's really well prepared. I mean, it's a really nice website, and I downloaded all the occurrences of um, recorded occurrences of Bigfoot, and there's even uh, uh, quality categories A, B, C. I don't know. So I took only the A. I mean, so. Is uh, higher. They're really certain it was it was seen there. And uh, by the way, some guys in there was some uh, Siberian conference. I put it in my note. According to Time.com, a team of of a dozen plus experts from 
as far afield as Canada and Sweden have proclaimed themselves 95% certain of the mythical animal's existence is in Kemerova region territory, some 3,000 kilometers east of Moscow. So, yeah, 95% certain. That's almost, it's really highly certain, so. And there's a one, uh, one uh, the group of colleagues, they did actually, uh, uh, did mark scent analysis with the, with the Bigfoot, and they mapped the um, areal and niche of Bigfoot. I, I, uh, they, when they made this paper, they didn't, uh, you know, they didn't uh, give access to the data set. So I wanted to reproduce that example from their paper, and I finished doing everything by myself. So it's a reproducible research, but you have to reproduce everything. Yeah. But nevertheless, now if you want to test some new ecological um, algo niche modeling algorithm, then you can just take this uh, Bigfoot data set and. If you teach it to the first or second year university, then the people get really interested, right? That's how you can trick uh, younger people to get a high interest in the spatial analysis. So here's this max scent. I'm not sure if this is going to run because you need to download the max scent. Um, I don't remember if I have it on my laptop. No, I don't have it. So I have a new installation. But you have to download the Maxent, and then if you run the Maxent, then you get then you get this thing. So that's the the Bigfoot output. And it is uh, the, my result that I got, they're very similar to the one they got in the paper. So their paper was okay, I guess. And so there's a Bigfoot. I even made the icon. If you make your own icon, you can put, I put a, I, I made a, a Bigfoot icon and then you just load it here. So you see this dark, uh, dark blue or black is the high probability of occurrence of Bigfoot. Um, I use some some seven, so these are the covariates. So there's a, a carbon above uh, ground, and then there's the um, land cover classes, topographic wetness in distance to roads, elevation, and um, uh, lights at night. So is it close to towns or further from towns? So it turns out to be mainly co correlated with dense forests. So we have a denser forest, you have more Bigfoot. Looks like the Bigfoot is occupying USA. It's like, it's like when you play with this uh, 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 war games or something, you put soldiers here, and it's Bigfoot. Oh yeah, this is, this is, the, this is from the, the, the Bigfoot uh, occurrences, so that's that's where they claim they saw the Bigfoot. Uh, yes, there's time attached. I didn't include it in the analysis, yeah. You can do a niche modeling uh, space and time. Although the Maxent is not, it doesn't work with time yet. So what you have to, you have to group the point data, and then, but you have to have a covariate also in time. And then you do a max cent, max cent, max cent, and then you see how the, the habitat of the Bigfoot changes, if it's changing. Well, good things for, for uh, good news for California, that's not so much Bigfoot. I think it's Washington state, that's the, really the Bigfoot state. Okay, so these are different, really, lots of, there are lots of examples, and you know, you can start playing with, uh, uh, with the um, gallery, and then you say, okay, I want to create something like this, but with my data. And then you look, okay, how, how did he do this? And then you look at the code. 
If the software is good, of course, the code should be short. This doesn't look so short. Um, this one looks short. I mean, I just go... Let's try this one. So I'm looking at... Yeah, so here's a data set. This is the uh, temperature measured at uh, meteorological stations. Now I have to reformat the date, you see? This is where I do the date reformatting because I have a date maybe just as a text. So let's see this head. So, so my date is just a text. Who asked? You, you asked about date, right? So look at this now here. So you see my date is just a text, but if I want to plot it in, in Google Earth, I have to do a step before I have to say, well, I want to get it in the right format. So, so then I do this. And now if I look at the head of uh, C, C time, now you see that it's more or less is the same, but now I have also uh, hours and minutes and seconds, and I see the time zone, which is, this is not correct, of course, because I got this, I got my time zone with here, Central European time zone. Um, well, actually it is correct, it refers to this data set, but I get like a one, one o'clock in the morning, you know, so it will, it will force something. I don't know why it picked up one, because he only has a, He only has a, um, a day. And then I get these spatial points. And now I, I create this uh, space time irregular data frame. So if I look at the structure. Let me see the structure. It's, this is uh, Ezra's uh, objects. They s they're, they're not so easy to read, if you ask me. So you see, you have the data frame. And there's the SP part, because these are fixed locations. And then there's the time. But then there's an extra list, which is the index or something. And then we just go and say, okay, I want to plot that. There's too many points. You, this is 56,000 points, right? But it's only, there are only, um, what is it, 150 stations or something. But I get 56,000 points because this is whole year, so 365 by 160 something, and you get 56,000. So you have lots of, when you work with the space-time data, you know, spatially you don't have so many points, but it blows up. And then imagine if you had the different depths also, and it just blows up. You easily finish like with million points. But then somebody asks you, how many points are like one million? But you only had like 50, 150 locations, yeah? But you know, you measure every day, and if you have 365 days, and then if you have different depths or whatever, and it blows up. So I cannot visualize all that. So I said, give me first 500, and then we can do a plot. And then we get this thing. And this is also actual, these are actual dates. And I can see how the temperature changes. I can also see there are missing values. If I zoom in somewhere, so I can see there's some missing values. And I can see how the temperature changes. But the important message is that, you know, you can visualize it and you can do some interpretation. I, I, I was thinking about this time series data, you know, and I discovered that actually that if you have a fixed locations and if you do measurements, the best way to visualize changes is still by just the time series plots. So.
So if you look at this example, uh, so that's here, raster, uh, raster brick time series. So if I visualize this thing, and so now I have a time series of rasters. These are the modis images, modis, modis temperature, temperature images. And if I visualize these rasters, I can see the, the changes. That's nice, right? But, you, you know, it's difficult to, like, it's difficult to visualize in your head, okay, what, what's really going on here? I mean, we see, okay, in some areas it's a bit warmer than the other, and then it gets cooler. Obviously, the mountain tops are a bit cooler. But then I put by automatically, it will also create this. So when you click on any point, any point that you put in this uh, raster brick time series, um, PlotKML will calculate this time series plot for you. So you can see how the temp daily temperatures, so, uh, so these are the temperatures from the MODIS, MODIS images. And you can see that there are, in MODIS images, there will be some missing values. And you can see that there, will, there might be some jumps. This is the eight, eight day MODIS. And so you see there's quite some irregularity in the that within a week or something, you can get a bit cooler period and a warmer period. So, so every point that, that is created in the uh, raster time series will automatically get a PNG. And then uh, Google Earth knows where those PNGs are. So I, I map the address on your computer and then it just plots it. Okay, okay, do you have any wishes? Do, would you like to see me visualize something? Or maybe I give you now some 10 minutes because we have to stop in 10 minutes because the webinar is coming. And I give you 10 minutes and you can try to do it with your own data. And then you call me if you, if you have problems. Just don't, don't put big data, please, just when you, especially rasters. Yeah, don't go, okay, now I have, a, I have like a, you know, two, and, two by 3,000 pixels and I want to visualize it. So you have to take a small chunk and do like a 100 by 100, 200 pixels. Okay? same package has, has the, the same problem, but when I oh. write library, it's same error. There is no package called, and it's already there. Oh. Which version? Which version? 3.1. She has 3.1. 3. I run it on Okay, so I go and Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what happens is that um, for Mac, there's always a bit of delay, look.